Yes. Okay, we're going to have an ask bar. Uh, what is the Norwegian Association of uh, Fertility and Child Business? And we are the only one. Only organization in Norway that's speaking this group of persons that uh, is facing involuntary shyness. Uh, we are the voices, we try to be the voices for this group of persons. <coughs> and what I'm going to, to speak a little bit about is what do we meet from society? What do they say about this group of persons? And this is in the region, but I, <coughs> so this is from the biggest newspaper in Norway, VG. And it's from 2015, when we <coughs> last had this large discussion about the question of egg donation. And, uh, or what do you call it? Uh, not egg, uh, sorry, uh, can somebody help me? You, you can say egg donation? Yes, okay. <coughs> and child is not a right, is the one argument, one of the chief argument I would say we are uh, facing. Uh, what is important is genes. Uh, the genetic bond between mother and child is the most important. Uh, and this is somewhat difficult arguments to, to meet. <coughs> but we are trying to say that you have this strong wish to, to want, you want a child very much, uh, and then you can't state the, the rights against the people that want child so intensely. Um, and what's, uh, and this families come in different shapes and forms and sizes, uh, and then the genetic bond is not the most important uh, aspect of it. And then this is, uh, that was uh, VG, and <coughs> because it's the largest newspaper in, uh, in Norway, of course it says something to the people to say, that, okay, this is something strange, it's something new. Uh, <coughs> the most usual aspect is, of course, the child, the mother of the <coughs> child is the one uh, that have, have the, having the child. Uh, and that the, the, if there is something behind, it's difficult, it's, it's a new thing. Um, but Vege and that milieu around uh, Vege is one voice. There are other voices as well. And one of the other <coughs> large newspapers in Norway, Aftenposten, is more right uh, orient orientated. Uh, and it also states that there's a <coughs> somewhat mother is not DNA uh, only. Uh, and I had this large. Um, newspaper articles for, I mean, one per day for this two weeks period of time. That's a, a quite a lot, <laughs> a long period <laughs> to write about uh, this sort of thing. Uh, no one had done it before. Um. <coughs> and of course, <coughs> showing picture from newspapers and social media is of course because this is especially social media is something people relate to so they have this uh, what I mean about this uh, topic they, o they often got to get from uh, social medias but even if they are large <coughs> amount of voices stating that, well, you, you can't just have, see child as a right. Um, we also see that there is a development that the people is supporting uh, that we have more um, assisted. Um, you have can say yes to egg donation and even to people, uh, single people, single women, that they can have this uh, chance to get a child as well. So the political debate is somewhat uh, coming after the, what the people mean. So they're not really catching up with, uh, with what the people says. So this is also from Aftenposten, but a number of people, most of the people I asked in uh, January last year, said yes to, to egg donation in Norway. And egg donation is one of the biggest topics that we are working with, uh, <coughs> actually. 
and I was in um, Parliament uh, today, Stortinget, and he has this hearing because there's a white paper uh, in the Stortinget uh, exactly now in this period. Uh, so then I said, uh, said that, and I also felt <laughs> and not it because I could see that people somewhat is going in front in this question, and the polit politicians is somewhat lacking behind. So hopefully they will be deciding something on egg donation later this spring. But of course this this is a area and something very private, so people don't usually want to talk freely about it. Uh, but if there are people, uh, this is actually a uh, petition from uh, Høyre, the right conservative party in Norway. <coughs> and when you are going uh, out, to say so, uh, and telling about this um, uh, disappointment, how <coughs> difficult it is to realize that you're not going to, to have a child that you really so much want, then other people is uh, also starting to, to say something about it. I mean, every time I'm in the newspaper, uh, it's always someone coming to me and saying, well, we have had problems as well. So it is a question that some think is very private, very difficult to talk about. And when you meet this, that I showed you earlier on, <coughs> these questions about, well, child is not a right, then it's often difficult to, uh, to answer it out for the private persons. But um, openness is very important, that we have politicians speaking about. <coughs> that more people is trying to, to, to speak about it, then I think it's easier for people to, to, uh, to get to know what it's all about, because you need knowledge to understand what this is actually all about. Um, yes, that was what I was wanted to, uh, to, to say. Okay. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> So from uh, Lisa, we then move to Bente Sandvik from uh, the Norwegian Biotechnology Advisory Board. That's right. Thank you very much. Yes. I am very glad that I decided to spend the whole day here because it's been a very good day, I think. Very thoughtful and very useful. I have to say that the National Advisory Board on Bio technology. We don't do feelings and emotions so much, but I think they are so important for what we do and how we come along our debates on ethical challenging matters. In Norway we have a not so long history of IVF, assisted reproduction, and again words, it was used, usually called artificial reproduction, which really makes it something very unnormal, not natural. On the other hand, natural isn't always good, is it? Nature doesn't work completely perfect. In Norway, first you had to be a married couple, and there had to be some kind of medical problem before you could get assisted help to reproduce. And you can get three attempts altogether, paid for. You have to pay some shares in that treatment, but that's about it. And today, 4% of all births a year, they come about by IVA, IVF. In 2009, we changed our marriage law. So we also allowed same-sex marriages. And after that, it was opened up also for same-sex couples that could produce a child if they got sperm donation. That is, lesbians, two women. And now we have the debate on single women, and we have the debate on male couples. Ring! Yes, what should be the state's <laughs> responsibility <laughs> to help? people in different life situations. At the same time, we have a lack of sperm and we're having a 
debate about egg donation, as you said. And there is not a political will to introduce it, at least not in the government. That is, for the last four <coughs> parliamentarian sessions, there might have been a majority in the parliament, but not in the parties supporting the government. So there is a very strange uh, thing there going on. What we have discussed in the advice report is very much how should we come about to get donors if we allow for egg donation. I know in England you have this concept called egg sharing. If you do get help from the National Health Service, you can sort of give away some of your eggs. Isn't that? It should be private rather than national. Yeah, it's okay, it's private, yes. Yeah. If you give some of your eggs up, you sort of get a refund on the treatment. But is that okay ethically? Or is it a bit of a challenge? We know that the younger the eggs are, the better. So really, you should maybe go to the high schools and say, please, would you like to donate some eggs? <laughs> but how would these young women feel if they later on are in the position that they cannot have children? Mm -hmm. So there are these kind of debates we are sort of doing in my board. <laughs> and we are not deciding anything, but we give advice to the government and the authorities to go on to make these decisions. We have come up with a recommendation that those that really should be specialists on how it feels not to be able to have children should be those that have undertaken treatment. So maybe if we opened up for letting the spare eggs after these treatments be donated, that could be a start. And probably these women, if they do get help and they do have some spare eggs that would be destroyed else, and were asked, would you would be willing to give these eggs and not put any money into it? Don't bring commercialization into it. Don't sell eggs or anything, but would you be willing to help other women? This is what we have proposed, the majority of the National Advice Report. Then the medical profession say, that's a very bad, bad idea. <laughs> that would not bring about the amount we need of eggs. And they should be younger, they should be fresher. But I think there is a challenge still. What about the donors? How do they feel? What will happen? From 2005, there is no longer anonymous. Uh, you, don't, you have to be known as a donor for sperm so that the child can come when it reaches the age of 18 and say, I want to find out who is my <coughs> genetical father. But as you can see from 2005, it has still not been 18 years, so we don't know how many people will knock on the door trying out that possibility. So it is, we are sort of like in a, yes, we, we talked about guinea pigs earlier today. <laughs> it's a big social experiment, actually. And I think especially if you grow up as a young boy uh, with lesbian mothers, you know that there has been a donor involved in one way or the other. How do you feel when you reach the age of 18? Would you like to find out about your father or couldn't you care less? We don't know the answer to that, how many would like to and who, who wouldn't really be interested or don't feel that's important. So I said we started out with IVF being, you had to be diagnosed with medical problems to get the help and then we opened up for the lesbians and now we are discussing whether we should help also single women, as I said, and what to do uh, in other fields. We are also discussing whether you should be allowed to freeze your eggs sort of to keep them later, we know that would be very often a better quality if you don't meet the prince of your dreams before it's too late. Maybe if you have your eggs from when you were 20 years old, you would stand a better chance and you might not eat, need egg donation because you have some eggs in the bank. How long can they store? 
that is uh, debatable. They are getting to reach better and better methods. So now they say at least five years, ten years, <coughs> probably much longer than that. Yes. So it's more a question about uh, what should we prioritize, prioritize with scarce resources in the medical business. And should people pay for this or should the state provide it for you? So that's one of the debates we are doing. And then, I also think we have this other debate that's not within the mandate of my board, but still the demographical picture altogether, as you talked about. More and more men, and also more women not having children. What does it do to a society altogether? And what does it do if we, in the end, sort of pressure, or we say we, we try technically to help everybody? Does that help people, really? Or does it put another pressure on you? <laughs> you have to try everything. You have to be this kind of laboratory <laughs> with your body <laughs> to try to achieve this. And what happens to you during that process? And what do we do about when you actually need another person to fulfill <coughs> your dreams, as in surrogacy? That is, for the time being, not being debated very much in Norway. We've had some people going abroad, and we had the debate when they come back with a child, whether you should sort of pursue them <laughs> by law, <laughs> or you should let that be, because it's allowed in other countries. So the question is very much also how much money, how much research should we put into this technical part of it? That's one part of the discussion. The other part is how do people deal with this? <laughs> the more emotional, the feelings, going through all the pressure. I think we have this very biological principle in our way. We want to produce our own children, we want to be part of families, but maybe we have to differentiate that a bit. There are many ways to live a good life. In general, of course, we should also encourage young people to have children, because the earlier you start, <laughs> the better are your chances. <laughs> So maybe that is uh, a part of the next welfare reform. That's also without the mandate of my advisory board. <laughs> but maybe that is a good idea to sort of, maybe you should be a student and have the possibility to have your children at a young age. On the other hand, that is very much against what we have learned as women. You should get your education, you should da -da -da, get things in the right order. So I think this has been a very good day for me to put your thoughts, your experiences into this somewhat more technical approach. This is of course about ethics, it's about where are the boundaries, where are the borderlines, what should we cross, what should we not cross, when are we helping nature and when are we threading over the thresholds of nature and doing something we should not do. Artificial uteruses, uterus transplants, listen to the words, they are possibilities within the near future. But again, would we like to go there or do we think this is beyond the borders of what we should do? I don't have the answers, I just feel very privileged to be on the board and being able to debating it in a very interesting way. I don't know if any of you have seen The Handmaid's Tale. I think that is also a... Have you? <laughs> yeah. That is... Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, not you yet. should see it and get scared. <laughs> the Handmaid's Tale. It's a book by Margaret Atwood that has been filmed. And that is about the day when a society is not able to reproduce itself. What happens? So we have medical aid that can help us, 
but also medical aid that can be misused. So we do have some challenges. I would just like to stop find, finding an argument to, we are, we are also debating whether we should uh, allow research on embryos until they reach the day of 14 after conception. I think that would be very useful to find out why do so many pregnancies end in the body. Try to find out more about genes, find out how we can help make better methods for the IVF. But still we also have to realize that how much more refined these things get, there will still be a success rate and there will be some that simply can't be helped. And that has more to do with emotions and feelings and realizing that that is also a part both of life and of being willing to go very long for the possibility of reaching the goal of your life to have a child. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me for this very important topic and uh, thank you also for um, for focusing on this issue. And one of the things, I've, I've been going to, I'm a demographer and I've been going to fertility conferences on, and often focusing on infertility and childlessness for, for the last two decades. And, and it's very seldom that we have such a good uh, gender mix. Usually it's uh, because of the data situation, it's uh, mainly um, female childlessness. Uh, but today it was uh, from the different presentations, a very good mix of both male and female childlessness. So I'll give an example, which could have been given for a number of different countries in, in, um, in um, Europe at least, and also Asia and North America, on um, changes in childlessness for men and women. And I'll start with the women. Uh, this is the birth year, the different colors represent the birth year, and this is the proportion who are childless. So at the age of 18, uh, almost everyone are childless, but as they grow older, the, um, the majority uh, tends to get the child, but if one reaches a different levels of childlessness uh, at subsequent cohorts. So if you look at those who are born in the 19, late 1930s, uh, you find that childlessness for women uh, was uh, somewhere around 15%, and it has grown subsequently for each successive cohort up to uh, a level in the early mid-twenties for, for women in Finland. So Finland, by the way, is one of the countries in, in the world with the highest level of childlessness. So even if overall fertility is actually quite high in Finland, in a European setting, it has very high levels of childlessness, and it also has uh, uh, relatively high levels of large families, which explains the relatively high overall level of fertility. So, but if you look at the male side, you find an even more um, you find a stronger development over time, and you find how high levels of childlessness. You find that for the most oldest cohorts, we don't know which level of childlessness they, they will exactly end up at, but we know that they are, uh, it will be somewhere around one third, which is extremely high. So one, one out of three men will be childless. Um, and I'm just finishing a paper on, on uh, the causes and, uh, and the determinants of childlessness and which, which groups, um, and if you look, uh, we focus on men in particular, because that's where the research is most lacking. And what we find is that the, the, uh, among men who do not own a house, for example, uh, there's a majority is childless, more than 50%. Among uh, men who, uh, have, uh, um, who have not entered a partnership at a given age, there's also very, very high proportions. And in certain regions of Finland, like in Helsinki, the proportion of childless is much, much higher. Than, than these proportions. So some, for some subgroups, it can be up to around half, or even even a majority of who are childless. Who are childless. So this is a, a phenomenon which is uh, increasing in importance in many countries. The focus has, in the research literature has been predominant on women. It should be much more gender balanced. And, uh, to some extent, it might be uh, a reason to focus more on on, uh, on the on the male perspective uh, than what has been done in the past because uh, um, that is what the research gap is to create. May, may I ask you something? Because, sure. Uh, 
Do you know if there, the, the numbers it includes child free? Uh, so this is the proportion. Who, or what do you mean? Who are who These are, are voluntary? Childless, yeah. But are they also child free in these yes. numbers? You mean voluntarily? Yes. yes. Yeah. No, this is everyone. So yes. we don't know so why they don't. They, yes. It's uh, okay. voluntary and involuntary. And it's very difficult to make that distinction because yes, um, yes that's was why exactly. I was curious. <laughs> so we, we have the whole population. Uh, I won't go so much into details on the long-term trends of fertility. If anyone you of you are interested, this is a meta-analysis looking at differential fertility over time from the Middle Ages to contemporary times. Uh, but this I would like to focus a little bit on. I just came back from Chile. Uh, in, um, and I give a, um, a presentation in Santiago, and, and one of the things uh, um, which, um, for which we have data on this is uh, differences in fertility by uh, level of education. Education is a prime driver of uh, timing of fertility, um, and um, it can be especially important for female childlessness, because uh, some women choose to education is uh, there's hardly any other social determinant which affects fertility so strong as education and for women who have uh, tertiary education that is high school or university education especially at advanced degrees um, the proportion who are childless uh, is in many countries much higher and one of the important reasons for this is that uh, many wait um, until it's too late um, so if you look at uh, the those with primary education in Chile, Chile is a very socially divided country, but you find extremely high levels of fertility in late teenage years in Chile among those with only primary education. Uh, among those with tertiary, secondary education, you find uh, <coughs> highest uh, levels of uh, fertility from the 20s to the early 30s. And for those who uh, are tertiary educated, you find highest levels of fertility in the 30s. Education is an important driver of uh, health-related behavior, but it's certainly very clearly and closely related to fertility timing. Uh, I also focused a lot on religion. I won't speak so much about this here, but this is religion can also be an important uh, mechanism and a strong identity marker which relates to fertility outcomes, including uh, whether one has uh, children or not. This is a... Um, Another project we're working on where we look at global family constellations and we find that in many countries in the world um, uh, there's a growing proportion of uh, individuals, particularly women who live alone at older ages. Uh, there's also growing shares who live alone um, at the, throughout the, uh, from early in adulthood. So <clears throat> this, is, this is important not only for, uh, for health reasons but also for, for example, housing planning. And childlessness was also one of the key motivations for a new center, which we just founded in Norway, which will start on the 8th of uh, May, officially, uh, where we look at uh, uh, changes in the parental age and uh, health implications. Uh, it's called the Center for Fertility and Health. We also look at uh, um, ART, uh, assisted reproductive technologies, changes in the uh, number of children, family dissolutions and breakups, and complex family types. You could have children without, uh, you could be socially a father or a mother, even if you do not have a lot of children. And the other way around, you can lose contact with your children even if you have children. And we want to understand the health implications of uh, these grand changes in family structures that are taking place in society, and take into account both the social and the biological pathways influencing the health outcomes for both the adults and the children. Uh, <clears throat> so we will look at uh, the family structures. I won't go in detail on this, uh, but also focus on which parts of the life course where the health implications of, for example, life childlessness can be strongest. Um, and what are caused by selection effects. It could be um, certain health uh, issues which could relate to both childlessness and and uh, other health outcomes later in life. So that is something we will take into account. And we'll look at the child perspective. Um, for those who have children, uh, we will look at parental fertility, the impact of, for example, having step brothers or sisters, 
um, relations to child health and, and lifestyles and its relations with family structures. So this is the new group and I um, will gradually expand as well but this is the core uh, team of the new centre here in Oslo at the Norwegian Institute of Health. I mentioned earlier that it's important to focus on um, uh, childlessness for, in terms of um, um, its implications for the housing market, but I also think it's very important to understand the imp implications uh, for, for uh, economic inequalities. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, uh, single households, you typically find much higher le levels of poverty than uh, households with uh, um, with children or households where, where there's a couple. Uh, fertility, fertility can be important for productivity in an intergenerational perspective. Um, and childlessness might, for some, relate to poor social health uh, and also economic outcomes. It's in many cases unwanted. Um, if you look, it's difficult to establish who is. Uh, child is by choice, uh, child free, and if you ask people early in life in across European countries, you find that only around 5% of females and 3% of males state that it did not, uh, they do not want to have any children later in life, so it's quite rare, um, and much higher proportions actually end up not having children. And those who do not have children um, tend to do uh, in some out with, for some outcomes, and specifically for sub, some subgroups, especially if they do also not have a partner, um, they tend to do much worse in terms of health, uh, in terms of having shorter lives, um, but also having high levels of uh, uh, various uh, health conditions. But not always. But, uh, but this might also reflect that, uh, that some of the groups who, who uh, end up childless are, uh, might have had worse health in the first place. This is uh, UN data showing uh, global variations in childlessness. And you find that for some countries, such as uh, in, in parts of Africa, the levels of childlessness is extremely low. While in other parts of the world, you find um, very high levels of childlessness. Of, this is for women. Uh, up to a quarter of all women are childless. There's also a very important gender dimension. Uh, so um, historically, in uh, this is, um, I lived many years in Austria, and in Austria, uh, historically, you found that the levels of childlessness, that's the blue line, was uh, for women born around 1900, was around 30%, which is extremely high. Uh, and the reason was because uh, the years these women uh, lived through their reproductive years uh, were ex some of the uh, worst years ever in, in recent history in Austria with very high levels of unemployment, uh, uh, two world wars, and uh, uh, high male mortality, which made it very difficult to find a partner. And 30% end up childless <coughs> among the women, which was back then much higher than for the men. In uh, Norway, uh, you find what is typical for the contemporary setting, with much higher levels of childlessness for men, which is now grown to in, uh, in the early 20s, while for women it's around 12%. So it's about twice as high for, for men than for women in, in Norway. And this is uh, typically what is the case. Because women, uh, of course, might have... Uh, uh, some men have children with multiple women. And hence there are fewer men, uh, fewer women than men who are trans. And there might also be very different uh, groups. Uh, men who are childless might often have relatively low education and lower income, while childless women tend to have higher education and higher income. So you might have opposite selection in terms of socioeconomics. On average, of course, there are many exceptions, but on average, this might be the case for both uh, for uh, men and women, which might explain the poorer outcomes uh, in terms of health, uh, often for, for many men who are childless. Um, so this is the um, intended family size in, uh, among men, 
And this is the intended family size among women. Uh, this is based on fertility and family surveys from the 1990s and the generation and gender surveys from the 2000s, which are uh, some of the best and largest fertility surveys available in Europe. And you find that uh, uh, most women and men tend to prefer to have two or more children. Um, it tends to be not so large differences between the genders in terms of intentions. Um, and uh, very few say they prefer to have one or zero. And for the women, um, there's also, also, even if fertility has declined, there's also almost been no change in, in uh, intended fertility. It's changed from 2.18 to 2.16 for the uh, 25 to 29 year olds. This is a study I did in where we looked at uh, a, um, female researchers who are. Um, there was a special sample where it one only focused on women with PhDs, and and we looked at uh, uh, preferences, which proportion would like to be uh, childless. So this is the high, most highly educated group uh, there is, and we looked at religious affiliation, and we found that those with no religious affiliation. 23% state they prefer to be childless. Uh, and this is much higher than any of the other groups, and you find uh, some differences. Uh, so the Roman Catholic majority in Austria, you find 7% only who prefer to be childless. And by the way, this is a group where childlessness is extremely high. In the German-speaking world, childlessness among female professors is, uh, can be up to 50-60%, according to some studies. So, uh, but this is not... Uh, uh, by preference, uh, Roman Catholics, uh, it's around 7%, Protestants 11%, Muslim 1%, other religious groups 4%, and in total it's around 9%. We prefer to be generous. Um, I think I have to end soon, but there's also an increasing political uh, interest in fertility, which uh, I think uh, should be considered in, in when discussing childlessness. So the, if you look at the proportion, percentage of all governments in the world who prefer to raise fertility, uh, in the 1970s, it was just a few percentage points. In the 2010s, uh, it's uh, uh, more than a quarter of all governments. Many countries in the world um, prefer to lower fertility, around 43%. But now only 30% of governments in the world uh, has no fertility policy. So this is the time for fertility policies. Um, it's, uh, more and more countries have, have an opinion about wanting to change their um, current fertility level. These are data from the US. We've seen, uh, these are survey data, so we don't have exact, uh, these are approximations, but you've seen a slight decline in childlessness among most recent born cohorts, and then a, a stagnation around 50% for women with ethnic differences, white women having around 70%, black 50%, Asian 13%, and Hispanic 10%. Uh, if, I think I have to end now, uh, but uh, there are, I also want to stress that there are new factors which probably did not matter so much in the past, which have become increasingly important for, for fertility. Um, and we find that for uh, Norwegian men born after 1957, um, um, neuroticism, which is a very common personality trait, that means being emotionally up and down. Before that, it did not have any significant effect on fertility, but for Norwegian men born after 1957, it depressed fertility and, uh, and related to an increased uh, uh, likelihood of being childless. And this is, uh, um, uh, this is important, and one of the theories for why this has been the case is that uh, men who are neurotic, they uh, might get uh, selected out of the marriage market and end up not marriage. And before, when marriage was universal and war, uh, this, uh, uh, it didn't have an effect, basically. And for women, there's no... Um, they're neurotic women, of course, as well, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have an effect, significant effect on... on, on uh, <laughs> so and so, childlessness is growing, it can be associated with poverty and health problems, it should uh, get more political uh, focus. Education is important, factors such as personality is increasingly uh, important, but it's also important to consider the 
the larger perspective and also consider issues uh, related to work and age discrimination and so forth. So I look forward to any questions and comments that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you also to Mr. Cameron. But to Mr. as we said, for your interventions, we've got plenty of time <coughs> for any comments, questions, general discussions. Opening up to the floor, Christina, you. Yeah, just on the last point, I have other comments, but I'll get to these last points of the new offices on uh, supposedly of men. So I'm reminded of an uh, <coughs> interview that actually Hilde filmed for her documentary with Anders Muller in, um, in Sweden, uh, who's also studied infertility. And uh, he was talking how he was really the first to, to challenge the idea that women are childless because of these pathological uh, features, so because they are neurotic, because they are passive aggressive, and so on. And he found that they are not uh, childless because of that. Uh, so they are childless, uh, and that's why they become like that. So he, he pointed out that the causal relationship was exactly the opposite. So I'm wondering, uh, could it be here the same? Uh, so how do we know that they are childless because they are neurotic and not the other way around? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it could be a point. There has been other uh, studies as well. Uh, are finding that uh, some of these personality characteristics do go in these directions. Uh, we do have, uh, many would argue, many psychologists would argue that some of these personality traits are relatively stable in the life cycle. They might change, particularly uh, in, in um, early life, but in adult life show a relatively high level of stability. So I would argue that probably uh, I don't think women's uh, neuroticism probably does not affect fertility, but uh, um, whether, whether you change your personality in, in response to childlessness, I'm not so sure that this is the case. I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, do you have any, any other... Sorry. Uh, 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 for for the, the personality label. I mean, I think uh, I also want to um, <laughs> to add the comment that I mean to, to talk about personality and uh, to talk about neuro neuroticism as as a, a personality characteristic. I find a bit disturbing because it might be just for a while. Yeah. It might not be your personality structure per se. Yeah. Uh, so I think you should be a bit more cautious about that. No, I, well, this yeah, is, well, I, I, I use, uh, so we use the big five personality uh, categorizations, which are commonly used, in, and, and there are multiple what, what are What, what, what so, are those? Can you elaborate on the personality uh, category? Uh, yeah, I could. I could go in some length on that, so, but uh, I, I'm not sure if this is the place of time, basically, oh, so okay. I can maybe, okay. so, but, but there are, but it's quite, uh, uh, that it's, they're very commonly used, and, and it can certainly have many other consequences. Maybe, maybe it could affect personality as well. That is certainly possible. But uh, many, much research suggests that it's relatively stable in the adult life cycle. Um, but you certainly can change, uh, change uh, um, uh, level of uh, happiness in life, for example, or, uh, and you might categorize that as a personality trait. But I think gynecologists or fertility experts also um, emphasize that neuroticism has an effect on women's fertility. So I find it a bit strange that you're not saying that neuroticism. Uh, has well, we do we not find it, uh, but it's often yeah. But they, tension and stress. Yeah. And but how do they know? Because uh, okay. I mean, if you're a gynecologist, you wouldn't have a big sample. You wouldn't have a representative survey. So you would. Um, uh, so we have uh, large-scale nationally representative data, and there's okay. very few national uh, national representative data in Norway, and actually in the world where you can actually study these issues. So I don't think. Yeah, but how do you uh, define neuroticism? Come again? Oh yeah, being uh, emotional. How well, do you define? Uh, yeah, but that is also difficult in a study like yours. Actually. Yeah, but it is quite sad. <laughs> The definitions are, are, at least among psychologists, they yeah. quite uh, commonly use these uh, this, uh, categories. Or not the job, Yeah. Uh, it's a kind of summarizing uh, the whole experience of the day. 
I, I feel really blessed that I was that I was given the opportunity to be here today and to listen to you all. I would like to look at you in the eyes and say uh, thank you so much for all the things that you said today. And I also feel now quite upset and <laughs> a kind of rage uh, because um, I think I, as a sociologist, I think that we need to uh, make a change in society perception about people who don't want to be parents or don't, who are not parents. And after uh, this, all all the data, I I feel like it, we were we're talking now about a kind of epidemic or uh, something that is wrong that need to be. Of course, uh, if women feel stressed and, and, and grief and, and, uh, and hardships because they can't be mothers, it must be addressed. But mm -hmm. I think we need a really deep social change about the debate of not being parents because I think that as long we look at, we don't talk about mothers who are neurotic or, or fathers who are neurotic or something like that, we still, um, we still do more of the same and it will be really uh, surprising if women will not be neurotic or, or upset or suppressed or, or depressed in a society that relates to parenthood as the most important thing and the only way of living on and all the other uh, alternatives are like lower I don't know how to say it now in English but it's like uh, the best the less best option um, so we treat it as uh, as uh, if we are being told that this is the main essence in life and we don't have other way to have families and relationships and getting old in a good way, and I know there are people who are doing it, then we still do more of the same and of course people will feel uh, uh, not good about themselves. I'm not trying to rob of the personal experience, so if women, of course I understand if, if women want to become mothers and they can't, of course it's, it, it brings a, with it many uh, difficult feelings. But I'm not surprised because we are living in a society that also tells us that there are no other option to live our lives and no other script. And this is what I said before about colonialization of the imagination. We don't have alternative scripts. So of course people will experience uh, there is a connection between, this is why I talk about the politics of emotion, because there is a connection between feelings and what society is telling us. So I, I really hope that I, uh, if I could say all of this in Hebrew, I would be more <laughs> fluently. And it's a bit, I'm, uh, I'm not sure that I'm, but I'm really, it's really, I'm, I'm about to have tears because it's so important uh, for me that the debate will change. And I think that the well-being of people will also change when this debate will change that there is not a hierarchy between parents and parents and non-parents. And um, there are so many other things I would, like from, in a different way I would say, but I hope that I manage to bring what I feel at the end of this day. Christine, did you want to? And um, I would like to add to what you're saying. I couldn't agree more. Um, it seems to me from what I've heard uh, about the policies that exist, that, that again, so then the focus is on how do we give the child to the women? How do we get enough eggs? But we don't question whether the life uh, without the child is actually possible. So the problem is not that the child is missing. The problem is our definition of what happiness is and what having a good life is. Yeah. So if we can redefine that, uh, perhaps uh, there wouldn't be so much uh, pressure towards necessarily having the child. And this is not just a problem of perceptions and what is in our mind. Um, 
because uh, I was uh, I was talking to Aira Bjorvik, which should have been uh, in this panel, but unfortunately couldn't come today. And she's an expert of uh, um, um, assisted reproduction here in Norway. And for example, she was telling me about uh, what the logic behind uh, the Norwegian policy of giving these free treatments uh, to couples who have uh, medical problems and they cannot uh, achieve the child. And the logic is that uh, the welfare state should ensure marital happiness. So again, what is the assumptions there is that if you don't have a child, you cannot be happy. And we want you to be happy. So why don't we question this? So it's not a problem just to change the debate. That's the starting point. But then we need to change the fact that reality is organized around those definitions of happy, wrong, and question, well, wrong, at least questionable definitions of happiness and what it means to have a good life. So I think there is a long way to go. And so first we need to change uh, maybe to see the problem, <laughs> then we need to change the debate, and then we need to see how do we change actually the way reality is organized around those definitions. Thank you, Christine. Hilda, did you want to come back in again? <laughs> and then Rob afterwards. Uh, yeah, just, just one comment to, to Christina, because I, I definitely agree with you uh, to a certain extent uh, that we have to try to change the uh, societal norms and values when it comes to parenthood and family life. Um, but then again, if we draw it too far, um, I'm afraid we might, we might risk to, to take the, the sorrow and pain away from the ones who actually really wanted to have children but never succeeded. Because there are some of us here. Uh, so, I mean, you can't, you can't only say that uh, society has to change it norms, its norms completely because there are, there are some of us, there are a few of us who never really wanted a child. So why on earth should it be considered um, um, a wish or natural to conceive? I mean, I think there has to be a balance there. Yeah, um, for you the balance, to be a so I don't want it to go all the careful. other way. Yeah. I agree with you. Great, thank you. Ron. Okay. I just want to add, there's a drive to socialise within society. And having children and being a parent is a, a great socialisation project. Just to throw it out in there, state the obvious. Uh, then uh, there's an uh, organisation in the UK called Donor Conception Network mm -hmm. that's got an awful lot of information about uh, donor conception and the uh, process. Uh, and uh, the diversity in uh, donors and donor families. Yes. Uh, and that's a, that's a, a charity type uh, grassroots organization but has very close ties to lots of uh, professional mm -hmm. stuff. But it might be worth looking mm -hmm. around for Absolutely. information. Yes. Yeah. And on the uh, stats, have you, I wonder, done the um, correlation between the high level of male childlessness and suicide and health and all that sort of thing? I, yeah, no, that's something, well, much of this research is something we will look into in the years to come yeah. in this new century. So we will, and, and certainly exploring which ways uh, you function best as a childless person. Uh, that's something we will focus a lot on, but uh, certainly uh, health and uh, uh, and also on the uh, neurotic now neurotic <laughs> syndrome. Uh, what other social economic factors were around at the time? Yep. Would the Cold War tensions be a factor in the late fifties, early sixties? Was there national conscription? Wasn't there? Uh, there's a whole plethora of other yeah. reasons that. Yeah, we, we don't you don't know the exact causes. You don't know. Uh, no, luckily. That's more research, hey? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? If not, I'll then pass back to Christina and Kelly, presumably together, who are going to wrap up. Um, I don't have any prepared wrap up, but I just want to say how inspiring this day was uh, and uh, uh, how amazing all the speakers uh, have been uh, and uh, how great the contributions have been also from the members of the audience. Uh, it was really a pleasure to be here and have the possibility to discuss uh, yeah, among uh, all of us uh, today. 
and uh, I hope we can organize this again because there is so much uh, that we were not able to say in one day and um, I hope this is perhaps the beginning of uh, a network uh, then, and that we can be in touch uh, and do some more work about this but uh, yes uh, and the member of this day will definitely stay with me uh, and uh, yeah thanks to all who have contributed uh, thanks Kelly thanks to the sponsors so thanks to the chairs thanks to everybody again so <coughs> yeah thank you <laughs> and thank you, yeah, Christine. Nice, thank you. Thank you.